Now officially welcome uh, to the last session of the uh, 2022 Emerging Technologies in Peace Building and Prevention Workshop uh, organized virtually at a New York University Center on International Cooperation. And intentionally, we didn't want to have a closing session as, as we don't wish this conversation to stop this amazing conversations that we had uh, throughout the previous two days. Uh, and I can't see a better way to keep a conversation open than through discussing an open source topic. Uh, or, or maybe even better, um, keep the conversation open through a book talk. Uh, I always found books, and, and I think books have always been a good way to, to connect and pass the knowledge, share the wisdom, and inspire us maybe to reflect uh, on, on past as what we were doing in the previous two days, uh, and also envision uh, uh, the future, learn something from the past, and then try to plan together uh, our future work. Um, so with this, it's, it's my great, great pleasure to uh, host this book talk uh, with Alexa Koenig, uh, our guest today, who is one of the editors of The Digital Witness. Uh, Digital Witness is a book with a full title, Using Open Source Information for Human Rights Investigation, Documentation and Accountability. Welcome, Alexa, uh, and welcome again to uh, all of our guests uh, today. Uh, I just wanted to give a couple of sentences before I give floor to uh, to Alexa and just to reflect uh, on, on what we were basically reflecting in the previous uh, two days as well, that, that we are uh, living in, a, in an era of digital witnesses or, or uh, uh, digital natives, how sometimes we, we call people uh, who are so versed on, on living on social media. Um, uh, and not only with social media, with mobile phones, uh, with even widespread internet, internet availability, citizens are becoming these digital witnesses. And in this very important segment of this uh, uh, life, these citizens are providing important contact, con uh, content for conflict monitoring, for documenting war crimes, for documenting government repression and human rights abuses. Um, and, and this is also an insight that I'm now uh, quoting actually from the report that we mentioned throughout this workshop as well that we published at NYUCAC a year ago where we are seeing one of the uh, also future potentials of utilizing these technologies and having a positive uh, impact in this field of, of work. Uh, so we also see that human rights researchers and activists often rely on, on these types of contents, on, on photos and videos, uh, uh, often contents that are shared through virtual uh, networks um, and contents, as I said, that are documenting uh, either war crimes or atrocities and human rights uh, violations. So um, we, with this, um, I wanted this book to be a sort of a spark of a bigger conversation. Uh, so we will have a chance with Alexa to, to hear more first about uh, uh, her work, uh, about the book itself, but also uh, as, as I introduced to Alexa, we will zoom out a bit uh, and see a bigger picture maybe about these, maybe look at these intersections between the human rights field, humanitarian field and the peace building field field um, uh, and, and see what are these uh, intersections and what are the lessons that we can uh, learn together. So with this big welcome to Alexa Koenig again, Dr. Alexa Koenig, who is Executive Director of the Human Rights Center, uh, a winner of the 2015 MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions. Um, Alexa is also director of the Center's Technology and Human Rights Program uh, and a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Alexa is joining us now live from this beautiful campus of, of Berkeley uh, from her office. Uh, and she also teaches classes on human rights and international criminal law with uh, this particular focus on the impact of emerging technologies on, on human rights practices. Uh, Alexa is co-founder of Human Rights Center Investigations Lab, uh, the lab that we are so eager to learn more about uh, now uh, and to learn from. 
And this lab actually trains students and professionals as well to use social media and other digital content to strengthen human rights advocacy and accountability. Um, Alex, I, I know I can't do justice to your profile and your work, uh, but uh, I will actually give floor to you now to tell us a little bit more about yourself uh, and to introduce your uh, work first, uh, and, and then we will have a chance to talk a little bit more about the book. Thank you, Branka, both for the kind introduction and also for having me here today and the opportunity to talk about Digital Witness, which was one of the most rewarding projects I think I've ever had an opportunity to work on. Also, thank you to everyone for participating today. There are several people whose names I recognize and whose work I greatly admire. So it's always an honor to have a conversation with so many people who are themselves pioneers in this space. Um, I uh, talked with Branka a little bit before today's session, and one of the things that I thought might be helpful to kick this off is to talk a little bit about Digital Witness and how it came into being. So um, as many of you may know, Digital Witness is, I think, one of the first textbooks that really covers how to use digital open source information as a method of fact finding to strengthen human rights investigations whether the human rights defenders with whom you're working are you know, investigative reporters and other journalists, whether they are advocacy organizations like the Human Rights Watches and Amnesty Internationals of the world or the smaller, deeply hardworking on the ground organizations and places all over the world. And then finally, if they're legal investigators who are trying to get justice and accountability in courts of law, whether places like the International Criminal Court or through more diplomatic processes in the UN um, or sites closer to home. So because it's a relatively new area of practice that borrows from much older methodologies, I thought I would start by even talking about what is the definition of digital open source information around which this book is structured and organized. So for that, I just wanted to show a couple of quick clips and we'll share my screen. So here you have on the right, Digital Witness, um, a huge nod and shout out to my co-editors, Sam Doverly and Dara Murray. Sam was the head of the Digital Verification Corps and Citizen Evidence Lab at Amnesty International. Dara Murray um, is my counterpart at the University of Essex. They were the ones that actually invited me in the beginning to potentially collaborate on pulling together an edited volume that would help to capture sort of the emerging methodologies that so many people have been seeing increasingly coming into the international criminal law space, the human rights space, and the humanitarian space. Namely, thinking through how we take advantage of our current information ecosystem, especially the large quantities of videos and photographs and posts that are being uploaded um, across the globe, obviously with great, with significant differences between different geographies, urban rural divides, et cetera, but still at a volume that I think would have been really difficult to imagine even a decade ago. At this point, as you all probably know, we get over 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute and over 6,000 tweets are generated every second, just an example of the scale of information. And I think a lot of us who have worked, been working in the human rights space um, began to realize that whereas a lot of time, more traditionally, it was so hard to get a lot of this visual material to be triangulated with what survivors or people on the ground were saying was happening. And also the physical evidence that's so necessary for getting prosecutions in courts of law or other forms of legal justice. Um, now, I think it's often a challenge of we're drowning in so much digital data, and we're trying to figure out first what's most relevant to the particular cause that we're working on, what we're trying to accomplish in the world, whether it's preventative or uh, justice related, and kind of how we can bring that in to strengthen um, our fact finding, given how unreliable some of this information can also be. So the definition that we have relied upon is one that comes from the Berkeley Protocol on Digital Open Source Investigations, um, which establishes that at least in the context in which we're working, digital open source information is information that's accessible on the internet by any member of the public. And they can access that, access that by observation. So for example, putting in key search terms and seeing what emerges through request, so maybe entering your um, email address to get access to a particular website or doing some more formal type of Freedom of Information Act related request, something that drags the information into the public domain. And then third purchase. 
And that one was probably the trickiest um, to define because we wanted to make sure that it included things like New York Times articles and other media um, information that you may have to pay a small subscription fee for, but that a general percentage of the population, if they have the resources, can access. It can't be so high that only major institutions um, can get access to it, but ideally there's a whole bucket in there that we thought qualified. And finally, it's information that you don't need a special status to obtain. For example, if you had a warrant or um, some other uh, means of legally compelling the production. And it also doesn't include information where there are legal methods of attainment, for example, illegal forms of hacking. Um, the book itself really came out of this collaboration that Sam, Dara, and I and others commenced in the fall of 2016 when we launched what we call the Human Rights Center Investigations Lab here at UC Berkeley and the University of Essex also launched a lab and um, Amnesty International had decided that one of the things that they really wanted to see happen was a broader dissemination of these digital fact-finding and digital verification skills. So I had met with Sam in the spring of 2016 and with a colleague of mine, we had told him that we were thinking about starting an effort at UC Berkeley that would bring together students from across this 55,000 person campus who are very international in orientation and also have a deep commitment to justice to see if we could train them in a lot of the skills that were growing increasingly important to the humanitarian and human rights sectors. Um, but there seemed, to be, there seemed to be a lack of formal training on digital fact-finding and digital verification. And certainly as bigger bodies like the UN, like um, the International Criminal Court, for example, were increasingly beginning to rely on digital information, we realized that it was really incumbent to create some kind of pipeline that could bring well-informed, thoughtful individuals into this field of practice. So in 2016, on the Berkeley campus, we launched the first investigations lab. Sam Deverly and others from Amnesty International came out to lead the training for those initial students. We have since grown to be a team of approximately 80 students headed by our investigations lab director, Stephanie Croft. These students speak approximately 30 different languages. They're able to source digital information from public online spaces across a number of different crises and conflicts and potential conflicts and are trained in kind of the ethics, the security and the psychosocial resiliency methods that I think is, are really necessary for keeping yourself as an investigator or researcher safe, but also the populations who are so directly implicated in a lot of the um, unrest that we may be seeing around the globe. The other teams, we now have a digital verification core that is seven in seven different countries, including we have now one in the city of Hong Kong, we have it in Mexico City, also in, in Pretoria and South Africa, a couple in the United Kingdom. And the idea is that we can also chase time zones where a team could be working on a particular issue in one part of the world. And as they go to bed, that the issue continues to be worked on. Our team at Berkeley is a little different than the others. Most of the other teams work predominantly for Amnesty International, but from the outset, we were really interested in how this could come into different lines of practice that are there to address human rights defense, whether that was the reporting sector, so we partner often with journalists, whether it's for legal accountability or whether it's for human rights advocacy groups. Um, I thought I would show a really brief clip of just our team and kind of what they do, because I think it illustrates in a way that's often hard to explain with mere words, um, some of the processes and practices, and then we can open it back up to conversation. We just yesterday witnessed a strong case. I was living in Egypt in 2011 when the revolution happened. I was really moved by the risks that I saw everyday citizens take to stand up to authority and to document abuses by the authority. I certainly struggled with guilt about leaving and this question of how can I, from the sidelines, support the incredible activism and not, not just leave and, and never look back. At the Human Rights Investigations Lab, we train students to comb through social media and other publicly accessible platforms on the internet 
to see if they can find evidence related to human rights abuses and to war crimes that are happening around the world. You'd be amazed how often videos are circulated and you're being told that this is actually Syria today when maybe it came from Ethiopia five years ago. So a big piece of what our students are doing is really fact checking. This is Smart News Agency. They depend on citizens using their cell phones to go out and document what is going on in Syria. This appears to be the bombing of an aid convoy. Whenever I see cluster munitions, that is something we would be particularly interested in because those are illegal weapons in this conflict. The first thing I do is I look at when it was published and I try to figure out if that's the, really the first time it was uploaded onto the internet. Turns out this video was uploaded for the first time here on YouTube on August 3rd. The other thing I start doing is translating and trying to figure out as much detail as possible. They claim that this attack happened towards the western entrance of the city. I'm going to go to satellite imagery now and start looking at the roads that are leading um, from El Atari West. A lot of what you'll find, I, a lot of what I do is just like opening. When we do training for digital verification, uh, a lot of people come along and think yeah. there's a so silver a bullet for verification. And actually, there's like not. Agile. Probably the trickiest part of the whole verification techniques we use is trying to work out exactly where a photograph or video is actually taken or captured or filmed. Uh, but often it's the most important thing we can do. So the goal is to make sure that this video is saved and that we analyze as much information as possible from this video so that hopefully it can be used in a legal investigation or one day in a case seeking legal accountability for this attack. To be able to have the people who are already there sending information out, either through videos that they post to YouTube or videos that they post to Facebook, that means we're hearing stories we've never actually heard before and wouldn't have otherwise. One group that we're working with is the Syrian Archive. Alhamdulillah. We have about 600 videos only related to chemical weapons at that, uh, but they are not analyzed. What you are doing is the most important, is analyzing and doing open source investigations, which we really don't have the capacity to do right now. So I've gone back to work on one of the convoy videos. I'm having a really hard time really geolocating it, partly because it's on just a big rural road. Uh, just send me the materials and okay. we can work on it together. Okay. Thank you so much, Hadi. I really appreciate this. Welcome. We all really love working on your projects. They give us a lot of meaning in our lives. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. No, thank you. Thank you guys so much. I have probably found some coordinates that are where the bombing for those trucks took place on August 3rd, 2016. There's this really interesting um, moment of excitement when you think you've really found it. And there's a part of me that is absolutely yearning for a lot more accountability and waiting to see what happens with this information. If you're going after the president of a country or a commanding general, the last thing you want is these cases falling apart. Our students go through the painstaking work of verifying so that courts and human rights investigators knew how much they could rely on that information and ultimately get those stories out to the world. What I hope for Andrea and for any of the students to take with them is just the skills that they've gained, that they're able to disseminate that through work that they do for better social good. The students who come out of this are going to be part of a pipeline that's never really existed before. And the potential for them to help various fields of practice is enormous. It's actually with this work that I've kind of gotten rid of a lot of that guilt. This work um, allows me to feel like I can directly 
give something back to um, the activists who take so much risk to document these human rights violations. show this video in part to give a sense of the context in which Dara, Sam, and I were working when we realized that in training students to do this work and be kind of forward thinking in terms of their engagement with digital materials, there was no single resource out there. And, and honestly, even with the book, there still isn't that could really help students think through the historical context in which they were working to think through the different methodologies that could be deployed to do efficient and effective fact finding online to think through the ethics of the kinds of surveillance related and surveillance you know, focused work that we were increasingly doing. Um, and to think through the digital and psychosocial ramifications of the work as well. And so we began to brainstorm you know, how fortunate we were to be part of a human rights humanitarian community that was really beginning to, I think, try and take a lot of what had been pioneered before us and bring a lot of what activists um, earlier in the, from the 60s through the 90s to the present day had really been doing in terms of realizing the power of visual imagery to really lend weight to people's understanding of the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So when we sketched the outline for this book, we really conceived of it in four parts, which is the basic structure it has now. First, thinking through the background and context and history of this area of practice. And we began with Ari and Nair um, and asked him to write the foreword. I had read his autobiography when we were first sketching out this book, and I was really struck by passages in that autobiography where he talked about having one of the first handheld video cameras back in the 1960s and trying to uh, film protests and document police abuses of those protesters to try to then use it to bring legal accountability um, for that overreach and to also get people released from prison. I know Eileen Clancy, who's on this call, has also done extraordinary work in that space and really building that up. Um, but giving that context and then going into the methods. So if you are working in the space, what are the ways that you begin to search for information effectively? How do you verify it and test its reliability? From that section, moving on to the risks, so what are some of the concerns and the challenges of working in this space around the physical, digital, and psychosocial well-being of all of those who are either working on an investigation or maybe um, depicted in it, may have been the poster, may be implicated via community. And then finally, uh, thinking forward to the future. And the future piece is one that we also manifested not only in the book Digital Witness, but in a project that I worked on with two colleagues, Lindsay Freeman and Eric Stover, to try and also begin to bring some methodological standards to this burgeoning area of practice. So we had also observed that there really were, weren't um, foundations for how to do this work, that people across areas of practice were using very different terminology. And there was some need to kind of bring the community together so we could at least be discussing the opportunities and the challenges that lay ahead. So we launched that protocol um, in December of 2020 in its advanced version in partnership with the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I'm hoping that later this year or early next year, it will be formally launched in all of the languages of the UN. Again, to provide resources and tools to disparate parts of the world who may wanna be growing and further advancing their engagement with these um, different methodologies. So with that, I have gone on way too long, so I will stop share and turn it back to Bronca. Thank you, Alexa. This was this was really great. Thanks so much for uh, sharing about your work. Uh, thank you, especially for sharing the video. Uh, so many things can can be put in such a short format. Uh, so much of a storytelling. It was really incredible to to hear this story and, and the work of your center and the work of all of the students. It's, it's interesting that your session is actually coming after the capacity building workshop that we just finished and we just talked about how we can work together on building capacities. So, so you are sharing with us a, a, a bit of lessons as well that you and your center uh, learned. And I didn't know about other centers, which was one of the, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, uh, is this happening somewhere else, not only in Berkeley? So it's great to hear that there are similar types of work happening in Hong Kong, Mexico, South Africa. Uh, that, that's really inspiring. Um, well, I, you summarized the four parts of the book. Uh, I think it would be great to start with the, some of the details from the book. I actually 
when you mentioned numbers in your uh, introduction, um, I, I quickly went to, to, to my edition to see the context. And I think it's really important to share uh, more of these numbers because some of them really are, you, you can't even believe that this is happening. Um, and, and I will just quote again uh, from the book that each day people worldwide generate at least 2.5 million trillion or quintillion of data, of bytes of data. Um, every minute, nearly 50,000 photos are uploaded to Instagram, 400 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. Every minute, over 2 million photos or videos are sent on Snapchat, and nearly half a million tweets are sent on Twitter, and so on and so on. And those are the numbers, I assume, when the book was written. So I, I can only imagine that these numbers um, are, are growing, and they are actually exponentially growing. So this is something, as you mentioned, that um, uh, essentially changed the work and the opportunities that we have in our field. We often hear a lot about the like negative sides of, of, of this work and all of the risks, but I think this, the work that you are doing is really a sort of a positive side and a lesson that we can maybe take and proactively uh, look into how this change context uh, uh, can be used now. And, and one of the, the issues that we are uh, looking into uh, in our field that you are also looking into your field is this technological development. So I thought, let's just chat uh, ab about this and what is happening actually, you mentioned the context from the 60s and 90s, things changed a lot. I think things actually changed even in the previous two years since you published the, the book. So it would be interesting just to, to maybe mention some of these trends that you see as a re really important. And before you start, I didn't mention this at the beginning, so I want to do this now and I see more people join the conversation, which is great. We really, Alexa and I, when we prepared for this, we really don't want this to be uh, our own conversation. So we want to open the table to talk to, about the open source um, investigations and information and, and type of work. So feel free to join the conversation at, at any point to, to ask questions. If you feel more comfortable putting them in the chat or uh, uh, join us directly uh, and, and ask questions or, or bring comments from, from your own work. Uh, so, Alexa, what is happening now with, with the, on the technology uh, side of the story that is bringing these new opportunities in our work? Sure. Um, you know, I think some of the digital trends that we have certainly seen is, of course, over the last decade in particular, this rise of social media and its use in disparate parts of the globe. Um, I think we know some of the biggest actors like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, but of course, we're also seeing a proliferation of social media platforms. So I think not only is the use, you know, continually rising, but it's also splintering. And I think that creates new opportunities and new challenges for fact finding and understanding Understanding. And I think that's why part of what we did with the protocol is really important of trying to get people to think through when they're doing this work to do a digital landscape assessment of the particular context that they're researching, whether it's from a preventative perspective or an accountability perspective, knowing who's speaking where about what and how. And I think that that part can sometimes be overlooked when investigators who are newer to the space rely on the platforms that they know how to search and use and use well. Um, but to really be conscious about what voices you're missing with the platforms that you traditionally use, who even has access to the internet and the digital technologies in the first place um, is a big piece. I think in addition, in terms of digital trends, we've got the social media platforms and what we're able to do with smartphones now in terms of capturing information and posting information. That often is giving you though the very ground facing view of a particular incident or event. So things that groups like you know, Witness and others or I think have been training people on is to always think about the visual imagery that we have from three different perspectives, whether it's the on the ground visual imagery, the kind of drone footage, you know, overhead view, so you can place that into context, and then the satellite imagery or 30,000 foot view, so you can actually relate incidents to each other and better understand how this fits in geographic space. So certainly the drop in price of access to satellite imagery, the um, ability for non-state actors to access satellite images, which didn't, you know, a couple decades ago used to be the case. Those are all new affordances that I think have been leveraged with, to sometimes really impressive outputs. 
Um, of course, in that information environment, there is also the risk of information disorder. And I think a lack of reliability in digital content that's really important. And that's a big part of why this book was written, was to bring more awareness to the need for careful verification of any information that you're going to rely on for either decision making or um, as potential evidence. So I think in the protocol, one thing we tried to do was have people um, to pull together the insights that have been collectively generated by this field of practice to ensure that people are always thinking through how do we check the technical, you know, technical information attached to the video or photograph. So the metadata or access data that give us clues as to when and where and on what kind of device this was captured. Second, thinking through the four squares of an image, whether it's a video or a photograph. If you've been told this is Syria in 2017, what tells you from the picture itself that this is in fact Syria, that it is in fact 2017, that the actors are who it's claimed they are. And then finally, the source. And I think analyzing how the information came into your possession and the reliability of that source for what they're trying to communicate with you. So are they even human or is this something that's been generated whole cloth and potentially pushed out through some kind of bot network? Is this something, um, have you been able to tell the person who claims to have posted this, captured it and posted it, is who and where they claim in the first place? So I think all of that, um, I also think we have new advantages, particularly in the last couple of years, as you're mentioning with machine learning, because of the size and scale that you were mentioning, it, that is just not human scale. We can't, you know, we can't mine two million videos, for example, taken from YouTube, and reliably know what we have and how much we can trust it. So, what we're really beginning to see is some pioneering work on using object detection, natural language processing to comb through these huge data sets to try to get rough cuts that then humans can do what they do best, which is then start to analyze that information. Of course, that also introduces the risk of bias, that machines are going to bias what we actually do pay attention to, whether it's because of the rough cut of videos that they hand to us, or because machines are just in some ways very stupid compared to humans, and they've been programmed to look for one thing, they may be missing atrocities or warning signs that are less um, amenable to visual detection. And so I think a lot of interesting work is happening now in better understanding those biases and how we optimize humans and machines working collaboratively, um, ideally not canceling each other out, but magnifying our impact. Yeah, I, I'm so grateful, Alexa, that you're bringing all of these points in because this is exactly what our work was uh, concentrated on as well. And uh, at, at one point in the book, I, I think um, one of the authors is mentioning the third generation of fact finding, like looking at ICTs and, and some of the things that you mentioned. So not only social media, but also availability of uh, satellite imagery and, and messaging gaps and, and social networks, of course. Um, but also we are just thinking about maybe is I don't know shall we call it a, a fifth generation or or definitely a new wave of developments that can that is potential and it's not only potentially developing it's already here as you mentioned with the machine learning natural language processing and, and other tools um I'm really grateful that you're also bringing this points of bias into conversation uh, I don't know if the if, if there is any potential solution of using the best out of the human capabilities where we are good as humans um, and, and then the best out of the machine learning capabilities as well. Uh, I, I don't know if we are there yet, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm just also thinking with this amount of data um, that, it, that is out there, obviously we will not be able to, to do that uh, processing as humans. I, I also wrote a, a detail from the book that was against numbers. I love numbers. <laughs> I love data. I, I think this was a Darfur project. Just mentioning this number, I was just, I'm impressed 28,000 volunteers that have participated in this uh, project, the Eco Darfur project from 147 countries. And, and um, these people were doing 16.5 tasks every minute for seven weeks. So it's really a huge amount of work being invested out there by, by the volunteers. And that basically it would take four years of full-time work to cover all of this. So it shows in a way for me, the motivating side of, of, of people's 
of uh, ambition to be there and to help, but also the challenge of, of doing this on scale, right? Like how often can we generate so much uh, of, of human capabilities? And then maybe potentially we can look into the power of, of, of machine learning or other tools that, are, that can help us process um, uh, these materials on time, because I guess in, in this work, the time is really crucial. Yeah, and I think from a peace building perspective, thinking about how we can detect the signals and the noise as early as possible and really take the insights from people who've been in this space for a very long time about how things become proxies for each other and how they correlate. So for example, one of the areas that I've been doing a lot of research on is the potential use of digital information to um, better understand sexual and gender-based violence. I think this also points to some of the ways in which machine learning and automated detection is in its infancy. A lot of the focus right now in object detection has been on things like certain kinds of illegal munitions and or um, the gathering of different kinds of vehicles that may indicate that fighting is about to break out or that it has actually occurred. But there are some kinds of crimes that lend themselves less well, I think, to the visual piece. And so really thinking through how gender experts, how boots on the ground investigators who know the correlations, for example, that the burning of villages often correlates with mass rape. Um, you know, can we use this to find the burning of villages and then be able to use other methodologies to dig into the sexual and gender-based violence that may not be as visually depicted? Of course, it may be visually de depicted. And I think a lot of the people who are training algorithms right now may be training for the things that seem um, the most amenable to visual detection and be making assumptions about what's not existing in our digital spaces that actually does exist. And that's something that we keep hearing as well as we need to get over those assumptions and have better conversations or more frequent conversations between different kinds of expertise that if we bring those conversations together, we can actually be much more strategic, thoughtful, efficient, and effective. Um, I think something that's also very interesting in terms of the capacity building is just how many people now are beginning to train professional teams on doing this, and we need to figure out a way to scale it. That is part of why we wrote Digital Witness, is we were increasingly being asked to come give talks at universities and different locations to train up teams of the next generation. The problem is there just weren't enough of us, and we couldn't even begin to, to meet the demand. And so our thinking was at least get a book out there that may be relatively accessible, that can be a starting place that other teams can build off of. And our professional training program here at HRC Berkeley is also part of what we're doing to try and seed this, where we'll do paid trainings in partnership with the Institute for International Criminal Investigations on much of what's in the book, but then do free trainings for a lot of um, civil society groups that don't have the kinds of resources that professional teams might have. And I think that's something that we really do need to think about moving forward. Um, how do we do this responsibly and at some form of scale? Yeah, I, I will come to, to the responsible part of the work and especially Berkeley Protocol a, a little bit later. I think this is really interesting for our conversations as well, because a lot of uh, our work was concentrated on, around ethics as well, as well. And I think the protocol is really important contribution to this. But before that, just quick comment first that the book is really appreciated. Uh, you, you can already see the impacts of this. We were really um, uh, using it when, when writing our report and, and shaping some of our lessons for the future work. There is actually a lack of literature out there, which I'm sure you, you are very well aware of. So, so it's really a, um, also a, a sort of our thinking of how to do this future capacity building through more books as well, uh, just scaling this type of uh, work messages and lessons learned. I will start introducing some of the questions that already came uh, through the chat. Um, and, and the first one uh, came actually from, from Paige, who is raising this question. We didn't mention this before, uh, Paige, and, and I wanted to introduce this discussion of private sector as well or tech companies. So uh, Paige Arthur is um, asking how this uh, human rights work, or we touched a lot about the humanitarian work as well, relate to tech efforts in the private sector for example, through Pix photo uh, video verification platform. Um, Paige is just curious about the partnership aspect of this entire uh, uh, work that, that you are uh, doing. 
uh, is there any role of, of tech sector out there or private sector, not necessarily tech out there? Absolutely. And um, we've certainly spoken with TruePIC, another group is Eyewitness to Atrocities. There are a number of organizations that have created new tools to more securely and safely transmit video and photographs that are captured on the ground in sites of conflict or where other where issues may be brewing um, and getting them into a secure repository of some kind so that they're safeguarded for later use. And, you know, I think a lot of, if you think about what we capture with our smartphones today, you know, we may just send it directly to Amnesty or we may post it to a social media platform. But what a lot of the private actors have been trying to do is figure out how do we create some form of chain of custody, some form of preservation that's maybe a little bit more robust from a legal perspective and therefore may end up having a little bit more weight in decision making, whether just the decision making is proactive and um, trying to prevent atrocity or whether it is uh, something that's going to come in later as evidence. I think that's a little bit separate. And I think a lot of us are talking among ourselves with these kinds of companies and organizations to help them understand both the opportunities, the risks, the challenges that we're facing that they might be better resourced to um, solve. I think the challenge for humanitarian human rights practice, peace building, et cetera, is that a lot of the organizations doing that work just aren't that well resourced to be able to pay the private sector to develop the tools that they need or they're just not a big enough market that the companies themselves are incentivized to actually be dealing with the low hanging fruit that is quite solvable. And I think that's a challenge to think through is how do we create new incentives to actually get more private funding and focus on this very low hanging fruit. And some of it is would be fairly simple for most technologists to solve. The final incentive that a lot of private sectors have is that they're trying to create something new and something big. And what is often needed, I think, in the areas of practice in which we're all engaged is not what's new and big. It's actually what's old and small and just needs some tech savvy and some knowledgeable tech savvy from people who really deeply understand the human rights implications and the ethics of what you're developing. On the social media side, we are often regularly in conversation with the companies themselves. And some of the ways that we've been talking with them over the years was starting back in like 2012, 2013, 2014, first trying to figure out what are pipelines to take get in, access to information that they take down that has some of the greatest value, I think, for people who are working on human rights or peace building, et cetera, which may be some of the more graphic material and therefore violative of their terms of service and therefore important for them to remove from public view. So that infrastructure and the need for thinking through the legality, the operational flows of information has been a big, big challenge. Part of that is also creating some kind of evidence locker, whether it's within the companies themselves or external to the companies for all of that content that they take down and remove that does have tremendous social value um, for knowing the who, what, when, where, and why of what is happening so that smarter decisions can be made about how to potentially intervene and safeguard people's well-being downstream. I think the companies have been open to a lot of that conversation, but again, at the highest levels, those kinds of conversations are not necessarily incentivized. So um, you do see a lot of public-private collaboration and conversation happening right now of how do we create an architecture for the future that does protect people to the greatest extent possible. Alexa, this is really an interesting angle of this work because usually when we now when when we talk about social media and and, and platforms, we usually look at this content that is violating the rules uh, as something that should be get down as soon as possible. And we are mostly critical about this, especially when we look into the automated tools that are doing this, right? When when they are doing it wrong or or missing some of the content. We don't often think about this uh, um, value of certain content that should be preserved. It should not stay on the platform visible, right? We share it if it's uh, violating the, the rules, but preserved for, for this work. Um, I don't know, I, I just wonder now from, from the peace building point of the work as well, are, are there any similar examples and how these pathways of cooperation with tech companies can be established just so this positive work and positive impact can be uh, achieved? Yeah. Um, re related to, to the, now I'm, I'm thinking about it and, and I want to introduce another uh, question that came in the chat um, and to connect it with social media platforms um, because a lot of, 
uh, the open source information is actually pulled from the social media platforms, I, I assume. Um, what happens with this content is actually uh, incorrect. So Bijan is asking, how do we deal with incorrect information which goes viral? And I assume that this entire world of misinformation and disinformation is now complicating your uh, uh, work a lot. Uh, what, what is, how do you deal with this? And if you can touch a little bit on, I, I promise to our audiences, we will also uh, talk a little bit about deep fakes as well um, and, and how uh, they are now changing again and, and maybe adding this new level of, of complicating our work, not only with misinformation and disinformation, but even with deep fakes. Um, yeah, so I think dealing with um, kind of the information that's out there that goes viral and may be influential but inaccurate versus the information that is accurate and verified and no one takes account of, I think we have to think about it in terms of both human intervention and we need tech company intervention. So I think the reality on the ground is that the tech companies right now, the social media companies are doing a lot of experimentation, do warnings work, do, um, you know, do safeguards work to say that this may not be accurate information. Um, what are their policies about removal of inaccurate data? It's really tricky because from a human rights perspective, there are so many competing interests, whether it's freedom of expression and access to information, butts up against the privacy interests, but bumps up against national security interests. And then there's the intellectual property interests of a lot of the people who are doing the posting. And so to try and figure out exactly how we best balance all those things pointing in different directions about what to do, I think it, it, it's, it's too easy to just jump on one of those priorities and then argue with the companies, here's how you need to approach this because you're really only looking at it from that one perspective without putting human beings in the middle of it and thinking about all those interests. Um, in terms of what you can do, I think though, we also do need more communication between the social media companies and outside scholars and academics who can also be validating what the companies say works and doesn't work and in doing independent research. I think. At this point, what is happening in these digital spaces is too important for societies around the globe to be left completely internal. And we need to think about what are the frameworks and the analogies that make greater interaction possible while still protecting the privacy interests. I think the good news is that from an academic perspective, a lot of times anonymized data can be very rich in ultimately producing data that's helpful for understanding trends and trajectories um, without having to necessarily dive into people's unique privacy interests. In the accountability space, that's very different. What we really care about is the who did it and trying to connect everything to that person who's going to be held responsible um, for what is happening or what might happen. So it's a little bit, I think, trickier there. Um, I think it also is really, um, I think also the companies need to be thinking about more aggressively what they can take down and what the justification is for that and being a little bit better and more aggressive in their gatekeeping. Of course, we do want to make sure that that doesn't silence voices. I think historically we know that when you put really extreme practices in place, it's, it's often flipped so that the people whose voices you wanted to have amplified are often the ones that are silenced. So how can we better manage that? And then finally, we just need better literacy too uh, in terms of the quality of the information to which we're exposed. I think one thing we've learned from doing all these trainings is that these are not hugely hard skills to teach. Um, you know, how to verify whether something is what it claims to be. And I think Sam Gregory of Witness has talked a lot about shallow fakes. Um, that was what jumped out to me the most when I first started doing this work. And I'll just give one example, you know, I think human Amnesty International had, had sent to them this really adorable picture of two little children who were huddling together and the narrative that they were being told was that these were two children who were newly orphaned in Myanmar. If you do a reverse image search of that particular image, you quickly find that all the major media used that photo to accompany stories about an earthquake in Nepal in 2015. But if you dig further down into the results, you find that actually the original photo was used in 2007, and these are two children from Vietnam. So just how common it is for even major media to get it wrong and then to be disseminating this inaccurate information, whether it's visual or textual, we need all media to be trained in these skills. They're not hard. You do the three-stage verification that I mentioned. They are time-consuming. Um, but they also save a lot of back-end headache because we do know that once bad information gets out in the wild, 
you can't rein that back in. It's out there, it's disseminating and um, caveats and qualifications and apologies are gonna be seen by only a tiny fraction of the people who consume that original material. Alexa, you are bringing so many points that I, I think we will need at least an entire day to cover all of this. This is, this is really great. Um, uh, I actually want to pick on two points that you mentioned. Um, the first one is mentioning another great practitioner from the Berkeley ecosystem again, Hani Farid, your yes. colleague who is doing a great work on, on deep fakes mm -hmm. um, and, and many other things, of course. But I just thought uh, uh, how important this is, what, what he brought through his work and many other people afterwards, of course, this uh, uh, risk of also claiming that everything is uh, uh, fake content. Mm -hmm. So I think you are also dealing with this double challenge out there, not, not only uh, doing the verif verification of, audit, of what is out there, but also fighting these narratives that something is, is fake. And then if we are not technologically advanced to prove ourselves what, what is the, the, the um, uh, sh uh, shallow fake or deep fake, how, how, do we, how do we do this work? So there are a lot of opportunities with new technologies, but a, a lot of challenges as well. And so, I, so yeah, no, sorry, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say, every time I talk to Hani, I get a little bit depressed and a little bit excited because I think he is so brilliant at thinking through how we can better harness digital technologies to challenge the weaknesses and the problems that come with digital technologies. And we're gonna need that because we're getting to the point whereas even two years ago, I would have said with deep fakes, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do the three-step verification process. You're gonna look for what other corroborating materials are. It's, it's relatively rare that if someone got a really extraordinary video of a huge event that a lot of people were at, that was mass atrocity, that it's gonna be the only one of its kind, just given how ubiquitous filming is today. Um, I mean, of course that can happen, but so you would do you would do all the safeguards, you'd figure out the source, blah, 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 be able to see, and then that would be a good check. I think what we're beginning to see and are going to be seeing more of is much more strategic placement of information that can corroborate fake news basically, or synthetic video. And um, I think people are getting much more sophisticated about how people analyze this. So eventually we are gonna need some of the digital technologies to help us as humans. I think, you know, Eileen brings up, brings up a great point that I'm hoping we can get to later, um, but about how we kind of over rely on our visual information and our visual experiences. So how um, we get the computer to help us give us an alert when we think something's authentic, but there are pixels missing, or there's evidence that something's been manipulated, or um, I know honey has been fighting for standards of, of embedding something to basically watermark that this was not synthetic video, et cetera. And it's gonna have to be a partnership between computer scientists and then human rights, humanitarian peace building um, communities in order to better figure out how we safeguard this going forward. Well, let's bring Eileen into the conversation uh, then and maybe make a, a little bit of a break from the tech topics and technology topics. So Eileen is saying, um, uh, Alex says you have spoken about some of the more intimate types of violence may not show in the visual um, artifacts that are most easily surfaced. Can you speak about the role of oral testimony and other narrative evidence? And I, I found it really impressive throughout the book to actually see how this work is presented as storytelling, as an important way to, to share stories of people, um, especially when their own voices are not enough. Yeah. Alexa. There's so much there. I mean, this is like, that's like an entire couple hour conversation. But I think even, <laughs> even thinking about, you know, how this is getting probably a little too esoteric, but how we think about facts on the ground. I worked a lot with Native American communities before working in kind of the space that I'm in now. And just what counts as information that should be relied upon for decision making for next steps is already a really, really big topic. And I think what we do know about kind of the three buckets of data that as a lawyer I would look at, which is the oral testimonies, um, the, the documentary information, which is the visual information, but also the written text, the email, like everything, digital, non-digital, and then third, the physical evidence. So like the getting the soil samples, getting the DNA tests, getting the weapon that was potentially used. All of that has to be brought together because all of those on their own tell us 
very, very little about the world and what's happened. And it's only by triangulating and using them to corroborate or disprove each other that I think we can get anywhere near the ground truth where we have enough confidence in the facts that we can reliably move forward. And I do think there is a real danger right now as some of these new open source investigation methodologies become newly sexy. Again, they're relying on uh, methods that have been pioneered way before now, but I think are now being packaged in new ways that catch a lot of attention. I think we have to really um, think about how we underscore the need to bring balance back in and the careful scientific, sometimes painstaking, sometimes very unsexy work that, you know, I think OSINT has been a big shining star over here. It's very sexy. It's very cowboy. Um, but the science, the slow, methodical checking of every bit of data takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of resources, and it takes a lot of careful thought, and it takes a lot of training and expertise too. And I think th that knowing when an expert needs to be brought in is a really big piece of this and people who have expertise other than what you and your smaller team actually have. The last thing I'll say is I think there's been a lot of social science research done on the lack of correlation between our confidence that what we see is what it is and our accuracy of interpreting visual information. And I think we are so calm, we're so reliant on our eyes and we're so confident that what we see is what we perceive that we don't often investigate that gap and have checks for ourselves um, to query whether our perspective of what's right in front of us may not be interpreted the same way by another person or might actually be quite leading either because of how it's been edited or how it's been manipulated. Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Eileen, for, for the great question. Uh, I want to bring Lily in as well, because I think you already mentioned this in your introduction a little bit, Alexa, but I think it would be good to hear a little bit more about this because it's such a crucial issue. Lily is asking in your experience, what are the risks associated with the work, with this work, and what protection should be put in place to safeguard people doing this work? With increased physical and cyber threats and arrests to, to citizens, journalists, and people digitally documenting human rights abuses and violence, what, what are the top things within our control that we need to do if we support implementing these methods? Um, and, and I think there, there is also considering the risks of, of people, not only who are doing the digital verification work, but also those who are contributing the contents, I assume, um, as well. And, and then I would also like you to talk a little bit about this risk of people who are actually going through all of this very violent contents. I, I know that you are very um, putting awareness on, on this as well, trying to protect uh, people who are doing this amazing work. So some of what I think we, I would respond to in that is um, kind of thinking through as we were do, initially doing this work and the ick factor started to rise up, that you were getting very personal information about people, that you were seeing things that you knew they didn't know you were able to see or make connections between what they had leaked out in digital spaces, um, to think through the ethics of the work. And I think a lot of times our decision making is shaped by law at one level, by professional codes of ethics that we're all required to adhere to if we are within a licensed profession. And then third though, I think this is the kind of space that's emerging is what I would call the OSINT ethics space. We've been thinking about it on our team in three buckets of risks and responses. One is around the accuracy of the information and the quality of the actual work that's being done and how we improve that quality because poor quality work is going to undermine our institutions, it's going to undermine our decision making, etc. The second bucket I would say is the dignity aspects of it. How are people being portrayed? Whose voices are being heard? How are people being credited, et cetera, and which has huge implications for their future, their well-being, their financing. The third one being the security bucket. So the physical security of all people who are involved, whether it's the investigators, the people depicted, the uploader themselves, the communities that are being impacted. Um, the so physical security, digital security, how are we keeping this data safe if we're collecting it and aggregating it? What are the safeguards? Who has access? On what terms are we ever turning it over to someone? Have we, have we done the threat modeling to understand the risks and mitigations? And then third, the psychosocial, um, on, on this kind of security bucket, the psychosocial risks. And that's a project that another colleague of mine, Andrea Lampros, and I are currently working on. It's just the psychological impact of viewing really graphic footage at the scale that we're being bombarded with it, particularly as practitioners, 
is so significant that there are real risks of burnout, of PTSD, secondary trauma. And so one of the things we're writing on right now is trying to learn from activists, from neuroscientists, psychologists, content moderators, what are the best practices we can all use, whether a practitioner or an, just an everyday person engaging with social media to better minimize some of the risk of harms to ourselves as consumers, but also to uh, the people who are producing this information and how it then gets amplified and projected. And I know we're at time, so I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Again, another, another field where I think you can, you can, it would be good to share some of these lessons to the tech companies as well, because I, I know that their uh, 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 content checkers are, are, are also facing similar uh, challenges and being influenced by all of the content that they have to uh, process on a daily basis. The time is running so quickly and I have so many other things to, to ask, but I, I really wanted to, to leave at least two minutes for you to tell us a little bit more about the Berkeley protocol. And, and I love this uh, notion uh, that you are sharing that with great power comes, comes great responsibility. Uh, and, and you are actually uh, um, dedicating a lot of efforts in, in uh, uh, putting the ethical standards to this work through the Berkeley Protocol. Can, can you tell us a little bit more um, what, what the Berkeley Protocol is? Sure, so the Berkeley Protocol, just, and also to explain the link I just popped into the chat, um, that is a special issue of the Journal of International Criminal Justice that some of the colleagues who wrote in Digital Witness and I recently special edited. All the articles are free to the end of December. So, and then some will go behind paywalls. So I just wanted to do a plug that a lot of the thoughts on new technologies and how it's interacting with the space, um, some of the most recent research is there and accessible. With the Berkeley Protocol, um, I think the intention there was that we were seeing a lot of organizations from different sectors were aggregating, collecting this digital material and wanted it to eventually feed into justice and accountability processes. Um, but they didn't understand sometimes the jurisdictional differences around how you collect the information, how that can impact the legal weight and utility. Um, but then also to start a conversation around the ethics, around the quality of information, how we effectively verify the content that we come across, et cetera. So hopefully it's a good resource for starting off and or if you're already practicing in the space, may give some new ideas of things that we should as a community of practice be in greater conversation around. Absolutely, that, that's a very great point. And, and as I said, this is something that we as a community of practice were very active in, in looking into this uh, topic came so many times in the previous uh, two days. And I'm actually very glad that it did. I'm glad that we have examples like this to, to learn from. Um, I think we are right on time, maybe a little bit later. So thank you, Alexa, so much for your time. I want to be respectful to you and, and all of our participants. If I didn't cover your question or comment from the uh, chat, please. Um, uh, Alexa, can people get in touch with you, continue this conversation, uh, follow the work of the Human Rights Center? Um, that would be great. We have a contact here, um, so you can directly get in touch with uh, Alexa. I just want to leave the final point. I, I just love how you're explaining this work and the entire book as advancing justice um, through the digital evidence and, and through the digital tools, uh, but with the power of people as well. I think we as a community of peace builders are really trying to, to do the same, to advance the, the peace and sustain peace. So I think there are a lot of synergies out there uh, and a lot of things to learn from each other and then to improve our work. So thank you so much, Alexa, for joining us. Is there any last message or, or last thing that you would like to share with our uh, guests today? I guess thank you all so much for the work that you're doing. Hopefully that I, I wanna see the peace building sector continue to engage with these to the extent that it's useful just so that it doesn't get to the accountability end where, which is the part that I'm so often focused on. And then the last thing I'll say is we did um, right at the start of the pandemic outline the book for Digital Witness 2. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to return to that soon. Um, certainly if you have thoughts on what would be useful going forward or are interested in, in contributing to that, we would love to speak with you. That's, that's great news. We look forward to reading the second book. Thank you. Thanks so <laughs> Thank much. Thank you so having. much, Alexa. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your time and for joining us. A lot of compliments in the chat, Alexa, to your work. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.